this morning with the confession. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of manna, the God of miracles, the God of mercy. Amen. Drawn to Christ and seeking God's abundance, abundance, let us confess our sin. God, our provider, help us. It is hard to believe there is enough to share. We question your ways when they differ from the ways of the world in which we live. We turn to our own understanding rather than trusting in you. We take offense at your teachings and your ways. Turn us again to you. Where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life and feed us for the life in the world. Amen. 
Beloved people of God, in Jesus the manna from heaven, you are fed and nourished. By Jesus the worker of miracles, there's always more than enough. Through Jesus the bread of life, you are shown God's mercy, you are forgiven and loved into abundant life. Amen. Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Holy God, your word feeds your people with life that is eternal. Direct our choices and preserve us in your truth, that renouncing what is false and evil, we may live in you through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our reading this morning is from the book of Ephesians, the sixth chapter. Like a general giving a rousing speech in troops before battle, this letter closes by calling on Christians to be equipped for spiritual warfare against evil. The full armor of God includes truth, righteousness, peace, faith, the gift of salvation, and the word of God inspired by the Spirit. Here's the reading. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And therefore take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day. And having done everything to stand firm, Stand, therefore, and fasten the belt of truth around your waist. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times, in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. Pray also for me, so that when I speak, a message may be given to me to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it boldly, as I must speak. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
As you probably know, whether you're a fan or not, football season is now upon us. At least for professional football, the preseason is. In fact, at our council meeting this past Monday night, I had to congratulate Steve Rinker, who's a big New York Jets fan, for their victory over my New York Giants. However, keep in mind, at least it's not the, the regular season yet. And as you also undoubtedly know, football players do not merely, merely wear uniforms like all other athletes, uniforms, of course, that designate the teams that they play for, but they also wear helmets and pads as part of their equipment as well, don't they? Which are intended, of course, to protect them during the game. That's because football is not only a physical game, it's also a contact, oftentimes violent sport, full of blocking and tackling and big-time collisions and hits. And so football players wear helmets, complete with face masks, to protect their heads and especially those vulnerable, those some would say underused brains inside their skulls. I'm just kidding. And they also wear shoulder pads to absorb the heavy-duty contact that occurs again and again, play after play, blocking and tackling. Then traditionally, at least, they wear what's called a girdle, into which hip pads and a pad to protect their tailbone are inserted. And then there are also special pockets inside their uniform pants, into which thigh and knee pads are similarly inserted, again, to protect the athletes by absorbing the forces generated by such large and powerful bodies moving at high speeds in the acts of blocking and tackling. Finally, they wear special cleats or shoes designed to help them grip the turf, whether it's natural grass or artificial, and to be able, therefore, to run and cut and maneuver out on the field. Those are the basics, at least. Some players have also been known to wear elbow and forearm pads, and quarterbacks generally wear a kind of flak jacket underneath their uniform jerseys as well to protect their sternums and ribs in the act of throwing the ball, because at that moment they are extremely exposed and vulnerable to the hits of onrushing defensive linemen or blitzing linebackers. They wear all this equipment, again, as a means of protection because football is an aggressive violent, almost warlike sport. You see, as many have pointed out, of all the major sports, football is the most militaristic, if you will, that is full of all kinds of strategy and tactics and plans. And at a time when most young men will never experience real combat, thank goodness, unless they volunteer for military service, of course. It's probably the closest that any of them will ever come to war. In the end, though, we always have to remember that it is still just a game. In fact, Hall of Fame defensive lineman Art Donovan, who played for the, the Baltimore Colts during their heyday in the 1950s and who had previously served in the Marine Corps during World War II, seeing combat in the Pacific Theater of Operation, was actually asked once if playing football is anything like being in combat, and he completely dismissed the notion out of hand. Football may certainly seem like war, to an outsider that is, to one who's never experienced it, but it's nothing at all like that in reality, Donovan insisted. Because in the real world, in the everyday world, outside of highly organized and officiated team sports like football, there are, however, clear and present dangers, to coin a phrase from one of Tom Clancy's novels. A world where body protection is not just an option, but a necessity, especially in times of war, but at other times, and in other situations as well. Years ago, there was a young wife named Tara Schaefer who lived with her husband in the small city of Moline, Illinois. She had a special gift that she wanted to give her husband for Christmas that year, but she was afraid that they couldn't afford it. And so she actually started shopping for it in September, knowing that it was a specialized piece of equipment and, and not every store would carry it. She finally found it, but to her dismay, as she feared, it was way beyond their budget. But she came up with the idea of laying it away and then making payments. And so she pitched her idea to the store owner, and the businessman sympathized with her situation and said, look, since your husband is a police officer, I sincerely doubt that you're going to try and take advantage of me. Why don't you just give me your first payment now, and I'll let you take the gift home today. As long as you make sure to follow through on the remaining payments, pay it off before Christmas, we should be good. And so she quickly agreed. The only problem was that she was one of those people who can't keep a secret. 
In other words, she couldn't wait till Christmas to give this gift to her husband. In fact, that very September night when he came home from work, she stood there beaming with a wrapped Christmas package conspicuously sitting there on the dining room table. And she said, Merry Christmas, and, and gave her husband a peck on the cheek. Neither one of them, however, realized at that moment just how significant that gift would end up being. Because just a few days later, on October 1st of that year, Patrolman David Schaefer was working the night shift when he got a call about a robbery in progress at a local drugstore. Arriving on the scene, he saw the suspect speed away in the car, so he took off in hot pursuit. Three blocks later, the getaway car suddenly pulled over to the side of the road and stopped. The suspect was still behind the wheel as Officer Schaefer cautiously approached. He was about three feet away from the driver's side door when the suspect suddenly turned towards him and fired an automatic pistol through an open window, sending a 45 caliber slug into David's chest. At 7 a.m. that morning, Terry answered her front door to find a police officer there and informing her that her husband had been shot at close range by a robbery suspect trying to escape. That was the bad news. The good news was that her husband was still alive. And as she listened to the details, Terry was overwhelmed and filled with joy that she didn't wait until Christmas to give David her gift. And she was ever so grateful that that store owner had let her take it home that very day, making only the very first payment. You see, the gift that Terry had purchased for her husband was a bulletproof vest, and it had literally saved his life. Football pads and helmets are one thing, but the kind of body armor that police officers and even soldiers wear in combat is something else. One protects athletes who compete in a violent and sometimes dangerous sport, but it's still just a game. The other protects those who live and work in life and death situations each and every day. Well, in our reading from Ephesians this morning, the author wants us to realize just how serious and even dangerous the life of faith for a Christian can really be. It's not a game, he says, but a struggle, literally a wrestling match in the Greek. And not just against flesh and blood either, in other words, other human beings, but rather against all the rulers and powers of the darkness and the forces of evil in the world. And so the writer of Ephesians exhorts his readers. He, he makes an urgent appeal to them to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. And then the writer immediately follows this with, put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. In other words, this is no game, folks. This is serious stuff. Believe it or not, this is literally a matter of life and death. It's like war, even. You're either going to stand firm against the forces of evil in this world, or you're going to be sucked in and deceived by that evil. George S. Patton was one of the most famous American generals in the Second World War. And in particular, he was known for being a, a brilliant field commander. And it was during the war in North Africa that Patton's tanks and troops were engaged in a, in a series of battles with the German Panzer divisions under the command of Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, who was generally considered to be, at that time, the greatest battlefield commander ever, even better than Patton himself. And yet Patton's forces did not fall for a single one of Rommel's well-designed traps and schemes. In fact, they successfully counterattacked and ultimately defeated the Germans. And reportedly, in one of the defining battles, just as the tide was about to, to turn in his favor, and as Patton watched the fighting unfold through his binoculars, he stood up in his jeep and shouted, Rommel, I read your book. He was referring to Rommel's classic book on warfare. In other words, Patton had studied and learned all of Rommel's strategic tricks, had planned his own moves accordingly, and thereby was able to defeat his German op opponent. Well, the author of Ephesians is telling his readers that he wants them to similarly prepare for all the tricks and evil schemes of the devil. St. Paul himself said as much in 2 Corinthians 2, verse 11, when he wrote, And we do this so that we may not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. And the New Living Translation renders that same verse this way, I do so so that Satan will not outsmart us, for we are very familiar with his evil schemes. That's what the word translated in our text as wiles 
actually means. Schemes, cunning arts, deceit, trickery. And it fits together then perfectly with the Greek word for devil or uh, diabolos, which is where our English word diabolical comes from. We know that tricks and evil schemes of the devil, writes the author of Ephesians, and so we need to protect ourselves and, and prepare to resist them. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you'll be able to withstand on that evil day and having done everything to stand firm. In his book, How Great Generals Win, Bevan Alexander tells the story of the general who defeated Hannibal, the Carthaginian commander who was one of the most feared generals of the ancient world. One of Hannibal's most effective tactics was his use of elephants in battle. The huge beast simply intimidated every opponent before the battle had even begun. And so for years, Roman soldiers and cavalry, Rome being the bitter, long-time enemy of the Carthaginians, were completely ineffective against Hannibal and his elephants. Until Scipio Africanus, that is, Scipio Africanus, a Roman general, made the brilliant tactical decision to startle Hannibal's elephants with the sound of trumpets which utterly confused and upset the elephants and caused them to break ranks and retreat in fear. And that's what the writer of Ephesians is advocating here as well. Don't be frightened and intimidated before the battle even begins. Instead, take up the armor of God in order to stand firm, to stand strong. It's sort of like that scene in the movie Braveheart where Mel Gibson's character, William Wallace, instructs his men to cut down some trees and sharpen the ends in order to repel the onslaught of the English heavy cavalry. As we heard the author of Ephesians using as his example the typical military gear of that day, particularly worn by the, the Roman army, then advises his readers to fasten a protective belt around their waists, one not unlike the padded girdle that football players often wear, <coughs> and then put on their breastplate, the ancient equivalent, of course, of a, a bulletproof vest, then step into the padded leather sandals that the, were the combat boots of that day, and finally arm themselves with a protective shield, a helmet, and a sword. It's funny thing about this description, though. The first time I read it, both my eyes and mind focused initially on the protective belt, the breastplate, the combat sandals, and the shield, the helmet, and the sword. Well, was the author of Ephesians literally talking about belts, breastplates, shoes, shields, hands, and sword, helmets, and swords? something else. And as it turns out, it's not a literal belt he's referring to here, is it? But the belt of truth he wants his readers to gird around their waist. Not an armored breastplate, but the breastplate of righteousness. Not combat sandals, but shoes that will prepare them to proclaim the gospel of peace. Not a regular shield, but a shield of faith which, with which to defend themselves against the flaming arrows of the evil one. Not a normal helmet, but a helmet of salvation. And not an ordinary sword, but the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, he says. In other words, as Ryan Finlayson has pointed out, they and we are to be armed not with the usual military gear, at least the, the ancient world, but, but with spiritual armor. We're to put on the belt of truth. In other words, we are to let the truth, let the truth be our guide in all that we say and do. One of the ways that evil is again able to work its way in our midst is through lies and deception, isn't it? And then we're to wear the breastplate of righteousness. In other words, we're to act rightly, to do what is right in every given situation and refuse to give in to any outside pressure or even to our own self-interest. As a runner wears the proper shoes to prepare himself or herself to run a soldier or a soldier wears combat boots into battle, the Christian is to put on whatever makes us ready to proclaim the gospel. And it's not just any good news, but the good news of peace. In other words, we are to speak peace and reconciliation just as Jesus did. And with all these, we're to put then also protect ourselves with the shield of faith. As Melinda Quivick has noted, the shield is defense against flaming arrows. Roman shields were, were made of leather, she says. They were then wet down with water in order to withstand any flaming arrows. And they were also large enough to cover not only the one who carried it, but one third of the person beside him. Ronald Olson describes the result this way. Ancient Roman armies simply marched headlong into enemy forces, but the well-protected soldiers stayed in such close formation, shoulder to shoulder, shields overlapping, that the blows of their opponents had little or no effect. 
And then whenever the enemy was worn out, the Roman legions were still standing. So too should Christians stand shoulder to shoulder, shielding and protecting each other, says our lesson. And then linked together in this way, watching out for each other, they can absorb or they can march rather confidently into the world unafraid. Speaking of shields, Bruce shields, once asked the question, why does Satan attack us with fiery darts of arrows? Answer, because a flaming arrow doesn't actually need to hit its target exactly. It just needs to get close enough for the fire to spread. And as we know, fire spreads quickly. What starts as a small flame could be blown out with, and that could be blown out with one small puff, if left unattended for just a short time, can quickly grow into an out of control inferno. In the church, for instance, it only takes one small spark of division or dissension among Christians, or one simple misunderstanding or overreaction that left unaddressed can quickly escalate and threaten to consume everything and everyone near it with its burning and destructive flames. And so as Christians, therefore, we are to stand with each other, side by side, shield to shield, so to speak. In other words, to cover each other's backs and in this way to thwart the devil's attacks. A helmet, of course, protects our most important and valuable organ, the human brain. But as Christians, we don't wear a real helmet, do we? However, as Christians, we are reminded of our baptism and the assurance of our salvation that we received when we were marked with the cross of Christ forever. Where? On our foreheads. And thus, there may not be a, a literal helmet to protect us, but there is the cross of Christ, which, walk, which offers even greater protection. And then finally, there is the one offensive weapon in this list of defensive armor, the sword. But it's the sword of the Spirit, in other words, the Word of God. In the third verse of his classic hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, Martin Luther wrote this, Though hordes of devils fill the land all threatening to devour us, we tremble not, unmoved we stand, they cannot overpower us. Let this world's tyrant rage in battle will engage. His might is doomed to fail, God's judgment must prevail. One little word subdues him. As our reading this morning and Martin Luther both remind us, the devil that we contend with, whether we picture this as a, a literal devil or simply acknowledge it as the anti-godly powers of this world, as one of my seminary professors used to describe it, whatever it is, it's ultimately subdued and defeated by God's word. In closing, our lesson urges Christians to pray in the spirit at all times. William Graham Scroge, a, a famous British, English pastor, and writer once wrote, pray when you feel like it, pray when you don't feel like it, pray until you do feel like it. Ultimately, of course, prayer, our communication with God, is also our strongest defense. To that end, says today's reading, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. In other words, just as Jesus used to caution, stay awake and always be on guard. Not only that, says our lesson, but always keep praying for each other, for our fellow Christians, for all the saints as well. Several years ago, PBS aired a special that covered the events leading up to the Battle of the Bulge during World War II. It was the fall of 1944, and, the, and Germany had been beaten back behind its borders. The Nazi war machine was in tatters, and the repeated bombing raids of the Allies had all but assured that Hitler's forces would never rise again. But along the leading edge of the battle lines with the German forces, the Allies were spread dangerously thin. In some places, their forces were so stretched out that a man or even a, a small detachment of soldiers could easily slip in between the lines without being observed. At the time, all across Europe, there was celebration, parties, dances, speeches, all rejoicing in Germany's defeat. Everyone agreed that the war was effectively over. The only problem was that somebody forgot to tell the Germans. Even as his forces were being shattered and driven back, Hitler was devising a plan for one last onslaught. Underground factories churned out more weapons and armaments and ammunition. Every remaining able-bodied man in Germany, even the very young and the very old, were conscripted into the army and trained for war. And as Europe rejoiced, Hitler plotted and planned. His goal was not to necessarily defeat the Allies, which was no longer possible, so much as it was to divide the British forces in the north from the Americans in the south 
and to drive a wedge between them and thereby to so demoralize them that they would give up and sue for peace, but on his terms. And tens of thousands of men died and remained during the Battle of the Bulge, all because everyone forgot that their enemies still lived and that the war was not completely over. You see, that's exactly what the author of Ephesians is telling us in today's reading. The enemy is mortally wounded. It happened when Christ rose victoriously on that first Easter morning. But for now, evil still exists. The war is not completely over. And without any hope to win, evil's only remaining goal is to divide and conquer, to cause as much ruckus and confusion that it can to kill and maim as many people as possible. So you had better not let down your guard, says these concluding words from Ephesians. Rather, we need to put on the whole armor of God and prepare ourselves for battle instead. We need, therefore, to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Amen. Renew our confidence in your promise of resurrection 
and life in the world to come. We pray especially this morning for Wanda Nebbiolo, whose nephew Denny passed away this past Tuesday. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. Receive these prayers, O God, and those in our hearts known only to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, Almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Let us pray with confidence in the words our Savior gave us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Christ has set the table with more than enough for all. Come. The body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Jesus, bread of life, we've received from your table more than we could ever ask. As you've nourished us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with your own life. In your name we pray. Amen. Now the blessing of God who provides for us, feeds us, and journeys with us be upon you now and forever. Amen. Thank you. 
worship is now over. Our service now begins. Go in peace. You are the body of Christ. Thanks be to God.